Aloha and welcome back to Talk Story with John Wahei and I have another exciting episode for all of you this afternoon. We are continuing with the series called Heroes, Rascals and Duds, the people who built modern contemporary Hawaii. And today we got a show and that we'll be exploring the origins of the Hawaiian Renaissance. So we'll be covering the years between 1970 and 1978. And we got some people here that are, were directly involved somehow in either the Renaissance or with writing about it. And uh, I would like to, at this point, introduce them to you. The first, our first guest this afternoon would be uh, Troy Andrade. Troy is, the, uh, is an associate professor at the Richardson School of Law, the University of Hawaii. Uh, his claim to fame, uh, as far as us old people are concerned, was that he's the grandson of one of the great uh, heroes of the Hawaiian movement, I, I think, uh, who personally a hero of mine, uh, Mr. Pai Galdera. We have um, Stephen Morris is with us this afternoon. Stephen was a participant in many of the events uh, that led up to what we call the Renaissance. And we also have with us Waters Martin, who was there with Stephen along the way. Now, we, we may have been coming from different uh, aspects of the society. Waters was a, uh, a businessman. Stephen, I think you were working with the Liliokalani Trust at that time. Hi. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, was a social worker. And Troy, you weren't even born. So, yeah. So, I, you know, the first group, so just to kick the show off, the first group that I remember that you could identify as a Hawaiian activist group really came out of Waimanao. And they were called the Hawaiians. And, and Stephen, I remember meeting you for the first time at a meeting of the Hawaiians. Can you tell us a little bit about the people who were involved in that effort, or anything that you can recall about that? Why uh, there and some of the people? Yeah, that were well, there. Um, the, 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 talks, the leadership, I think, um, came out of Waimanalo, but. Um, Pye was, was actually the uh, chairman or the president of the organization. Um, the others that I remember worked closely with him were who um, originally was from Molokai. Oh. Um, let's see, um, Jimmy Zan from Molokai. Um, Arnold Kidder, you remember Arnold Kidder from Waianae. <laughs> Arnold Kidder, right. Uh, and and what, what about the Kalahiki brothers? From, yeah, um, you had you had Uncle Mel and and Randy from uh, from Haula. Um, you know some of the others like David Tai from Emanalo, uh, really strong grassroots, and they went about they went about organizing. Um, statewide, so you had leadership spread out decentralized across the state. You had folks on on Kauai like Oga Holi and, and on Maui you had Christine Teruya and on Big Island you had Anna Nathaniel and, and uh, I can't remember some of the original people from Kona but it really was a statewide organization. And in, it, in fact, it, it was it, the first uh, statewide organization, if I remember correctly. Uh, now, Troy, you wrote a book about this. Uh, you know, uh, did you talk to any of these people that uh, Steve just mentioned? And in addition to hearing your family history, yeah. So I, um, I wrote my dissertation. It's, it's hopefully it'll be a book one day. Um, but it really is looking at the origins of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And, and so the book is about OHA. Um, but obviously, you cannot talk about what happened in 1978 without talking about everything that was happening in the 60s and 70s. And so that what, that's what kind of turned me on into this. And I talked to several people. Um, 
but primarily I talked to my grandfather about this. I knew nothing about this growing up. He didn't talk about this. Um, my, my mother knew what was happening, but she didn't tell us about it either. And it was only because I was in college one day, um, homesick to be frank, Googling pictures of my family members, uh, because that's what you do when you're in the middle of a snowstorm. And I come across Ian Lynn's photos from a protest at Parker Ranch on the Big Island. And lo and behold, there's my grandfather with Sonny Kaniho and a whole bunch of other people. And I call him up immediately and I'm like, what, what is this? Um, and he tells me about, about what he was um, involved in and why he got involved in the movement. And it really was um, to protest, to begin to hold accountable the state of Hawaii for not moving fast enough to help Hawaiian homesteaders and those that have been on the waiting list to get access to a piece of property. And so he, he you know, he dropped out of high school, um, but he was kind of a community organizer. He worked at the Waimanalo Teen Project. And the story goes that he was, um, he was asked to take a child home one day, a child whose family had been kicked out of a homestead property. And the child lived at the beach in Waimanalo. And he said that he was there trying to hold down a tent one night because it was storming. You got the wind blowing in from the ocean and from the land. And he thought this was so wrong. And there were so many uh, Hawaiian families that were there on the beach. And so he decided to organize and put together this, this group. No, no. When I remember in those days that one of my first meetings with the Hawaiians, the group called the Hawaiians, was at the yeah. Merchandise Mart building downtown on Alakea Street. The building no longer exists, but in those days, it, it, it seemed like that office was uh, owned by a, a gentleman called John Dominus. John Dominus Hope. Now, if I remember correctly, Waters, you, you were pretty good uh, friends with him. Tell us a little bit about John Dominus and how he gets into this and how these pieces all come together. Well, the first time I remember seeing John Dominus Hope was at a rally at the Shell for the Hawaiians. And here comes this very elegant, you know, almost British Hawaiian man, very kind of <laughs> eh, I would say. And he starts to talk about the importance and he used the word lahui, lahui. And I had never heard that. And he was emphasizing the importance, you know, as of a group, as a family. And he was quite grand and quite elegant. And he was one of the, you know, the speakers at that time, you know, but across that's what, 50 something years ago. The next, well, we knew John Holt because he published, you know, he, he published a book called On Being Hawaiian. And he wrote about the frustrations of somebody who was, you know, I hate to use hapahaole, I hate to use that word, but who was English, Hawaiian, Tahitian, and he rattled all that off and how, while they owned all of Makaha, you know, by the time it got to him, you know, it, it was very difficult for the family, but he was educated and he went to, you know, America on the East Coast, but he was very grand. And so somehow he got, he got hooked up with Guard Ke Aloha. And that's when- Oh, Guard Ke Aloha, it's another name, yeah. Right, and Guard worked um, ultimately in the publishing company because John Holt's second wife, Patrice Damon, you know, was able to uh, create a top gallant and published many of John's books that had been waiting, you know, to be, you know, to be published. And so Guard became active with him and also with Moana Lua to save Moana Lua Valley. And so Guard, was the wordsmith to many of those if I remember correctly, the uh, the Damien family, Patches, uh, John Dominus' uh, wife, was very active in funding uh, people from Waiholi Waikani and uh, in opposing uh, building the 8th Street through Moanalo Valley. And I think uh, uh, that was the Kalahiki brothers when uh, Randy uh, and uh, Mel Kalahiki were from. Uh, why Julio Right, because you know, Patches, even though they owned, you know, Moana Lua for her, you know, the Damon estate. And that's a whole nother story how they got it from Pawahi, you know. <laughs> the only thing that she gave free clear to anybody, but you know, Damon, 
was her attorney. So watch out. <laughs> watch out for your lawyer. You're trying to say, right? right? Uh, no. uh, 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 you know. So anyway, so John Holt and well, Patches was, you know, active politically to an embarrassment of her family. If you read her obituary, you know, they brought out how that, you know, she was supposed to be a communist and all kinds of things. She was, but she was actively supporting maybe the underdog throughout the world and trying to make social changes. But fortunately, she had money. She was able to do that. But anyway, so John and Patches and Gard and many other people, you know, and John, well, hey, you were part of the home room. Yeah, we were meeting at the home room movement, which, uh, which, by the way, I think brings up another name, uh, Stephen. Remember, we, we were meeting at the, uh, at the Lily Okalani Trust, if I remember. That was the home rule movement that started there. And the person, if I remember correctly, and uh, the person who was the head of Lily Okalani Trust, he wasn't native Hawaiian, but he, in my opinion, very instrumental, was, uh, was Oshiro Masaro. 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 Oshiro. Yeah. In fact, uh, he seemed to almost encourage people like yourself who were social workers to get active in the Hawaiian movement. Uh, yeah. That was a little bit about he, uh, that. He, he knew I, I was a terrible social worker and being a counseling and everything. Most of the families that I work with, I mean, I, I could identify them because my family just as problematic as they were. He saw in me another uh, another way to get me active and keep me active in social work. And now doing social action and social change work. But Masaro was a wonderful guy, great leader. And it, it, it's amazing that we, 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 you know, he was, uh, in a way, again, he was not a native Hawaiian, but I think he was an unsung hero because he encouraged so many of his social workers to join yeah. the Hawaiians. To, to EU. We, uh, we used to have meetings, yeah. as we got, uh, as uh, Waters was pointing out, at the Lily Okalani Trust. And, George, Georgie, Georgiana Patikin right. was a oh, social yes. worker and became the director of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands later. Yep. She was the all there. Now, all of this takes place in the early 70s. And I remember there was another group that was starting out. Maybe, Troy, you might have come across them. Uh, and they were called uh, Aloha, the Aloha movement, or the Aloha. Uh, and that was the first time. Was that? It's the Aloha Association, if my memory is. Oh, Alo Aloha Association. And, and that was the... Do you, any of you remember any of the people involved in that? Uh, Troy, when you put, did you write uh, about Mrs. Rice and Lucinda? Yeah, so what I, what I recall um, is that they're so somewhat identified as the first you know, group that was really looking at, um, and some may dispute this, but we're looking at sovereignty for Hawaiians. I know they had a big phone drive um, or a, a a, a drive that happened, uh, I believe it was at Iolani Palace to try to raise um, funds. But Waters, do you know anything more about the Aloha Association? You know, it, it was almost mystical because, you know, she was a taxi driver, her car, oh, sorry. You know, the car caught on fire, everything, you know, was destroyed. Her, I think she was sleeping in the car, but the only thing that didn't burn was Hawaii Story by Hawaii's Queen, Lindy Okalani. And so she took it as a sign from God that this, you know, so she read the book, she felt, you know, she should do something to carry on the work of the queen. And I, I think her car burnt up in Waikiki. So anyway, she, and if you met her, you know, she was just a very, you know, not a, just kind of plain Hawaiian, kind of tough a little bit, you know, the old style eyebrows, but, you know, she really felt driven. And so she was very outspoken. And somehow she got her, you know, she was able to do what she did and ended up in Washington, D.C. with Auntie Lani Kalama. They were handing out copies of the reprint Hawaii story. They were trying to meet with the various, you know, senators and congressmen. 
Yeah, and they were actually successful. I mean, I think they met with Patsy Mink and Sparky Matsunaga, and they, they were successful in having them introduce sort of the first reparations bill in, in the federal government for No, this for is Hawaiian. about the same, the same time that the uh, settlement was being done, the reparations with the Alaska Natives. That's correct, yeah. And what I remember about the Aloha Movement was that they were the first group to, uh, well, the Hawaiians focused on Hawaiian home, and the Aloha Movement started to focus on ceded land. And they were the first to let people know Many of us didn't know these things. Let people know that uh, that Native Hawaiians were entitled to revenues from the sea land. I think Charles it's, Maxwell was associated with the uh, Aloha. Charlie. Charlie, Charlie was your Charles, buddy, Steve. Charles, Charles Rose. Charlie, Charlie Rose. Rose. I remember up there. But um, I think her name, Louisa Rice, was, um, she was a D.L.O. I know that because I went to school with her sons at Kamehameha. But um, as, as, as Waters and, and Rice said, it was kind of very spiritual lady, you know. And, and it was people like um, Charlie, the two Charlies and other um, a couple actually think became the executive for the organization uh, in the beginning. Um, as you remember, he was a longtime politician in Hawaii. Yeah, Kekua um, Kaapu, in fact, his, his claim to fame was that he, he grew up in a grass shack, you know? Right back, uh, yeah. and, 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 and he was briefly in the, he was in the Constitutional Convention too. Mm -hmm. But Kekua Kaapu, Served as a council member, I think, for a while as well. Yeah. yeah. You know who was interesting was that right about this time, since you mentioned the, the glimpses, uh, the beginnings of the of sovereignty or the uh, dealing with the issue of sovereignty, and uh, was a gentleman named uh, Kawai Puna Prashin. I, I don't know, Gail Prashin, and uh, he was uh, everywhere. I. I I remember. Uh, can I share a story about how that all happened? John? Yeah. Why don't you get it? Yeah. So, I was gonna ask actually, you. I can say in his group on this one. We were contacted, um, the Pi, Pi and the leadership at the Homes were contacted by um, an organization called the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder, Colorado. And they were interested in coming and helping us set up a, a way, um, a similar organization here in Hawaii that could present Native clients. And, and two leaders of the Native American Rights Fund were invited to come to Hawaii to speak. And we had very large meeting. I don't know, Waters, if you were there. But in the library of the Queen Lilio County Center, the one on Halona Street, Muo Laulani, and um, the two gentlemen was with John Eckhoff. And, and at the end of the meeting, Troy, your grandfather, he asked for any volunteers in the audience to take on an initiative like this. And I remember Kawai Puna G and I raising our hands and Ren Kaleki. We all were in the back of the room and we all stood up and said, Yeah, we'll we'll take on the challenge. And, and we actually went on to to develop the Hawaiian Coalition of Native Claims, which is the precursor to the Hawaiian League Corporation. Yeah, it's the beginning. It was the it was the beginning of what now is the uh, um, the what, what Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation. The yeah. Native Hawaiian Legal, Legal, Legal Corporation. Corporation. Yeah, that you know. So all of these things have these these little entry points, and so uh, Waters, you were in 1974. The Hawaiians go up to Parker Ranch and. Uh, Cut and cut the chain up there. 
and, and I, you know, in my my mind, that is the first truly Native Hawaiian protest. Up until then, we had uh, Kukua Hawaii and others, but they were basically multi-ethnic, multi, mo mostly uh, young people rebelling against the established. Now we have this uh, protest. And were you up there with them? Did you go to the 1974, uh, either no. one of you? No. No, but I can I tell a story about that? Uh, what's that? got very late and I just flight out of Honolulu and I got there late. So I got to spend time with all of them afterwards. <laughs> you know what? The bar down the road. <laughs> so my my uh my granddad and I, I also spoke to uh Gil Johnston, who was an attorney uh for legal aid. Um and what they told me was that they actually had planned specifically where they were gonna cut the fence. And exact and they they and only my grandfather, Sonny Kanijo, and Gil knew about this particular area and it ended it ended up that this was actually not even parker ranch leased land this was yeah. land that was kuleana land so that people would get off scot-free but they could get the media publicity of challenging oh, okay. the state department of land and and its practices to leasing to parker ranch that's kind of funny because you know the <laughs> first guy that got the, that this is a story i heard and one of the gentleman who was there was uh, was named uh, uh well what is the name from from Waimanalo uh Joe Joe, Joe Castle, Castle. Yeah. yeah he was actually Castle. from the big island yeah, but then the, and he he said he cut the, the fence you know and he also got the uh, he cut the chain and then they opened the gate and went into the property and everything but he was the first guy arrested because a cousin somebody's cousin, Evan, or, you know, just another Hawaiian guy who was the, the, the policeman I actually drove up and uh, at that time. And, he, and you know, he's going to have to get him out of there or do something. And he drove, uh, and Joe Tessel didn't want to walk up a hill. He had to go back up to where everybody was. And he said, hey, let me ride in your car. He says, well, if you're going to ride in my car, I got to arrest you. So he became the first Hawaiian to be arrested. It, you know, there were, it, the people were a lot more mellow uh, in those days. In, in fact, tell me, because you were there, uh, at least at the aftermath, Steve, what I heard was that not only people actually volunteered to go down to the police station to get processed for the arrest, and because they didn't have too many people to process them, they actually brought food and fed everybody. So they had a fajita right, oh. right at the police station while they were getting oh. arrested. Yeah. <laughs> the arresting officer was, I think, cousin of Joe's. His name was Larinoff. Yeah, Larinoff. Officer Larinoff. And that was 1974. And, and you know, uh, right about that time, and this is the, uh, right about that time, one of, uh, I think, an unsung hero of the Hawaiian movement was a gentleman from Kona called uh, David Roy. Mauna Roy. And I remember Mauna coming and talking to you, Steve, and to myself and to the other Native Hawaiians that were in the law school about a place called uh, Koloko Honakahau, which was in Kona, which is now a national park. And Patsy Mink was actually sponsoring this park. But uh, we worked on it. And I know that uh, for a number of us, that this was a very transitional experience, right? and, uh, especially for yourself. So maybe you want to recount, uh, if you could, uh, that experience. Hello, was you know, basically private land that um, I think the Greenwells owned a big chunk of it, but it was all destined to be part of you know, that whole Gold Coast plan that, you know, the state had planned for on the north corner from Kailua going north toward South Kohala. And, and Koloko Honokoha was destined to be a basically a hotel resort, marina type development. And, and um, there, uh, David, David and others, grassroots folks from Kona organized 
the protest against um, against the plan because of you know the area being one of the last remnants of uh, of, of what a traditional fishing village was. I mean, it had it had two big fish ponds. It had fish traps. Uh, there was a street of canoes going out and catching opelu. Um, it, it was a full working Hawaiian fishing village. Supply a lot of protein fish um, uh, to, you know, um, you know, traditionally going all the way back to, you know, the chiefs and Kamehameha. So David, David and others went a protest and they went to Patsy Mink and Patsy was able to get a bill passed establishing the Honokaha Commission. They had some people on there that I can consider to be Hawaiian royalty. Um, Iolani, 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 Arthur, Emily Thomas, um, Filippo Springer, um, Kiki, Chinhaka, all of, all of these. I, I, I thought they were like, you know, they were the the knowledge base of what Kona was all about. And so I, as, you remember, remember. as you remember, as you remember, David took us along on a hike across Kaloko Honokaha with Kioki in the Hawaii being our day. And I think you remember we Kiyoki came across was an a, old cowboy from uh, that yeah, area. Yeah, he was an old, old Watery cowboy from, if I'm not mistaken, Kohala area. But if you recall, we came across that cave, very old cave. It had been basically desecrated by artifact hunters. And we, I remember standing there as Kiyoki began his Uwe, his Awe chant. Putting the bones back into in cave, and he was chanting, "Away, away, away!" And I consider it to be one of the fine moments in what pretty much radicalized me the rest of my life, you know, and what yeah. made me uh, stop so on. What I what I remember most because we were all standing there, and he jumped into the into the cave and started uh, away and started putting the things back was the moment that really struck me was he was facing away from us when he was doing a lot of this and then all of a sudden he turned I think you wrote about this I, I this that second when he turned around and we saw tears running down his face yeah but this old tough cowboy was literally heartbroken yeah over, over the scene and you know what's interesting about Koloko Honakaha, which leads us to the next effort in a way, was that it was the first time, at least for me and for a lot of us, when we started to spiritualize the Hawaiian movement, where it went from something more than social economic kind of activity, what was justly due, or political activities, to the idea that the land was uh, was more than just uh, something that you produce houses or you know it was more important, which takes us right into the hokulea. In fact, one of the people people but before I leave, uh, Steve was a little bit modest because he actually wrote the um, the plan for that part. And you didn't you have a we had a contract with the Department of the Interior? He actually wrote the, the plan. Was, I did the editing. It was a, it 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 was a, a hui. It was a kako thing. Um, it was a. Um, I, I remember. I mean, ha I had some. Herb Kane did all the artwork for the report to Congress. You did one really critical section on the hiring of Native Hawaiians, yeah. which is really controversial because. The National Park Service 
is is basically a federal organization and, and both discrimination is one of their their big no-nos right so he were here we were proposing to congress that we create a national park where only native hawaiians be hired be trained and hired so that was like ground yeah it was um, kind of interesting because when we came back uh, when that was kind of done when we came back her went off and uh, with the, started the whole uh, hokulea remember yeah. and and then you and water you went to kahoolawi at one point as well uh, and a whole bunch of people and the two simultaneously began right after that and there was sort of what in my mind's eye, I remember about that period was that was that all of a sudden we got the spiritual basis for both for the entire Hawaiian movement. The idea that the land was sacred, the land was uh, special. The idea of aloha aina and all these concepts started coming up. And one of the people that uh, was very instrumental in doing all of this was a woman named Auntie Emma Defree. I don't know uh, if you guys have any stories about Auntie Emma, but uh, uh, what is you, 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 did you know Auntie Emma? I'm sure you did. Oh, yes, I met her. In fact, I can tell you in summer of 1967, I had come home after one year in, in a way in West California, not knowing much about Hawaiian history. And I remember my mother who taking us as children, you know, 10 or 12 years old to Queen Emma Summer Palace. And we had, I had never been back, but I knew where it was. And I went there and Auntie Emma was sitting, you know, on the lanai. And I talked with her and I told her who, you know, how they ask, who's your family? And before, you know, an hour or two will buy, We're, our families are related. I'm not sure exactly how, but that's, I used to visit her when I was going to, you know, between classes. And I would just talk with her. I wasn't like Frank and Kavai Kapu Okolani, who was a student, but I knew her, you know, from, Goddess of Hawaii, and the next time I see her is when she's with, you know, Pacheco Olave Ohana in 76 or so, and she's, you know, the spiritual guide. But I knew Auntie Emma from, you know, way back. She was, uh, she was an important part of the movement. Actually, the, one of the interesting things about the Pacheco Olave Ohana was the inclusion of the uh, kupuna. In, in their deliberations, and, and it, it was like a search for knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge that was, for many of us, hidden, not really told to our, our particular generation. But Steve, you were part, and in fact, you wrote about this, and it's a great, this great episode in, in your book, if, if those of you who haven't read it, called The First Landing. But the, about that whole, the first, time the ohana tried to occupy kaha'ola and th this is uh, uh, well i mean the first time might have been when walter really yeah. just went over anytime he felt like but yeah. which we can talk about that but you, you, when well, the let's... formal first time was why don't you tell us a little bit about that well that was you know i, w I wanted to just share about the kupuna though if we we wouldn't have I wouldn't have, let me say, I wouldn't have gone to Kaholavi and occupied it in, in that in that one situation in January of 76. If they hadn't given us their blessings, you know, and Auntie Emma was one of those who, and there's Molokai and Karaku from Molokai, you know, would shake her, her cane at us and implore us to do more, you know. We looked at, we wouldn't have gone. You know, it ended up um, there was um, it, again. It was uh, a cool thing. It was a hui of us from, from Honolulu, from Maui, Charlie Maxwell from Maui, the Molokai hui aloha. We were to we planned and and it was I. There there are those who say there was no plan. It kind of, with, but we, we landed on nine of us landed on Kaho Lobby in a, a protest occupation January 4, 1976. Um, 
and we stayed on the island for about eight hours until we got transported off the guard. Um, it, it was the beginning of a whole series of occupations uh, that played after. Um, and and you had a the group to protect Kaho'olawe Oana that grew out of out of these occupations that began began organizing the Aloha Aina um, since uh, yeah. I think the one story you want me to share, John, is is of the kupuna that I took from Big Island me. Yeah. Uh, and Ellen Myers. Auntie Ellen, I knew in, I was working for Liliokalani Trust in Lopuna, and I had to get to know her really well. And when she found out I was going, she wanted to come and said, well, she's 70 years old already. And I said, you sure you want to come? This could be very dangerous. And she said, oh, it's going to be fine, you know. So Auntie Ellen went, we took, I, I, she was my kuleana the whole time. Uh, I, we were, and, and there was this one instance when I think she was, she was a blast. I mean, <laughs> she did stuff on the island, but just blew my, my, my video camera run out, ran out of batteries, right? So the battery pack, those big days, those old days, the battery pack. No bad, no more power, and I come off the I come off the hill with my my coast guard, and I see her going around the, the the little cove area, you know, like she was videotaping all of the police and and U.S. attorney was there, like she had film in the camera, and I <laughs> when I asked her, I told her. See, Ellen, there's no batteries in there. She goes, they don't know that. <laughs> and, and it was just a kind of the that humor that just kind of lightened, you know, the whole atmosphere up. I, I love this. I love these stories about these kupuna because it so expresses what their presence in the movement. I mean, there, there, there was... I guess when you when you hit a certain age in those days, you could get a little naughty, you know, and, and they oh, would man. do things that were, were really funny. I love the scene where you're pushing her off on the Coast Guard. Oh, cutter. well, that that was that one again. She was my kuleana. I, I was not up to her, her, but when they, when they brought us to the Coast Guard cutter, they had a skiff and they brought us off the island to the Coast Guard in the middle of the channel. It wasn't really rough, but the, the ship was walk, rocking kind of back and forth. And we had to climb up this chain ladder. And um, I remember she going in front of me and I said, Auntie, I'll be right on my shoulder under your butt and keep pushing you up the ladder as we go up. Well, we got about halfway up and the, the kind of this to one side and the ladder kind of like swung out a little bit and she lost her step and I looked up and her butt kind of like landed in my, my eyes and my nose and everything <laughs> and she kept reeling you know and kept saying is that you is that you and I couldn't say anything because it would have made everything worse right <laughs> Oh, such a great to, to the top and she she turns around and she tells everybody i think steve just goosed me down yeah. <laughs> you know there, there, there was so many so many moments of 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 what i remember most about that about that whole period of was the the humor the underneath all the pain and the action there was this kind of human so, you know we have you know, you know you know us hawaiians and even the scariest moments we find the weird crap joke right? that <laughs> that is 
That is pure Hawaiian humor. So, so Wallace, when did you go to the island? I know that you you occupy, you went on an occupation. Well, I went on the guard Kealoha and I went on the second legal access. We flew uh -huh. on a helicopter that we had provided for the kupuna. On the Trask is, was looking for four hundred dollars, and I didn't have your telephone number to call you, Governor. And so we put up the, <laughs> and then we uh -huh. said to Hamuli, "We will fly, you know, in and out on the helicopter." So we stayed there three days. It was very difficult. You know, the, you know, the, the lua was really a lua from all that. And so the first flight out, Guard Kilo and I flew, brought back, and he, we had friends that were staying at the penthouse at that hotel. And we went immediately there. But, you know, we were there for the second, and it was very interesting because they were organized. Everybody had a task. So, you know, those of us, people who could go out into the hills, and I guess, I don't know, we, we stayed at the shoreline. But... I went on that and then I went one more time. And for that, we, the first time was at Hakio Alva. The second time we went to Smuggler's Cove, which was much nicer. And, uh, but I had to switch it out, I was drawn. I went up uh, when, I, when I was in office, when I was in the governor's yeah. office, I, I went up to do some special planning. And uh, what I remember, this is a well-kept secret, so it's gonna be, what I did was uh, I made, all my security guards wear models. <laughs> all these guys wear models with a gun. You got, you got Tom Hugo to um, wear a model, but uh, and and uh, Mokiao and all of them, and they they put the you know they have to carry their weapons, so you know they, they were doing it. You know we got we only got and there's so many more exciting people we haven't talked about Walter, we haven't talked about Emmett. Uh, Georgiana uh, with the movement and then uh, getting into anti Frenchy. And on the meanwhile, the Hokulea, Hokulea uh, just started, it was, there's this parallel track. And so, and also there's a completely growing uh, side to all of this with the, with the development of the music, uh, with uh, Gabby Pahinui and the Sons of Hawaii and Sandy Manoa. And, the Casameros and all these people playing. Uh, one of the most interesting things for me uh, doing that side of the cultural side of the Renaissance was the development of male hula. I, I was at law school and I remember these uh, female students begging us to take them down so she could see these half naked guys dancing, you know, and it was, it was all so fresh and new. But uh, that's about, I, I don't, I'm out, out of time. So if you guys uh, feel up to it, I think that we ought to have a part two to finish off this uh, particular era. So I like, uh, I'm going to circle back to all of you and see when you're love, available. And, love and share these stories. Troy, Troy, did you ever go Kaolave? Oh, I've never been yet. Do it. Never been yet. Oh, my God. You got to do it. But in, in, in any event, Waters and Steve and Troy, I want to thank you all for participating with us this afternoon and I want to invite you back. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha, everybody. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.